Um, thank you so much. I think a second round of applause for Carl and Aaron. That was just truly magnificent. My name is Henry Timms. It's my great privilege to serve as the executive director of the 92nd Street Y. And as, as I was listening to that, uh, it, it reminded me um, of perhaps the most profound artistic experience I've had here at the 92nd Street Y was when Andre Schiff joined us to play the well-tampered clavier, both books, uh, without touching the pedal, without reading uh, a note, all from memory. And he played this, as a, it was a Herculean feat of musicianship. And it, and it happened uh, immediately after Hurricane Sandy had hit. It was, I think, uh, a week just after that hit. And I remember there was a lot of conversation amongst our staff as to whether we should even go ahead with the event. Was it responsible? Was it appropriate? Was it going to divert resources? Would people want to come? And it was a tough night, and every seat in the house was full. Uh, and he completed this amazing work, and he took the ovations he deserved. And he was called back for an encore. And he came back for the encore, and... and I, with everyone else, was wondering what this encore was going to be. What was he going to do at this moment? And he smiled just a little bit. And as he smiled, he started the prelude of the piece all over again. The very beginning of this incredible work, he started all over again. And in that moment, he made a statement about the arts, which I hope we reaffirm today, uh, especially as we mark September the 11th, especially as we think uh, of those people to our south who are suffering today. And it reminds us that the arts, in the most profound way, are an act of renewal. They're a way that we all find ways to begin again. Um, as I'm looking across this room, I I'm thinking about that pillar there. And I was standing next to that pillar uh, perhaps two years ago, and a, a lady came over to me and said, you won't believe who the first person I ever heard speak at the Y was. And I said, who? And she said, I was thinking she would say Bill Gates or Bill Clinton. She said, Robert Frost. And I said, wow, what, what was it like? And she said, well, I was talking to him just where you and I are right now. And I said, wow, um, <laughs> this is the ultimate downgrade. Um, so I said, wow, so what did Frost say to you? And she said, well, even, uh, she, Frost, this was the end of Frost's career. And he uh, was, was obviously very famous and he was still out. And, and she, said, she said, Mr. Frost, why are, you, why are you still out there? Why are you still talking about your work? And Frost said, because even Homer in his age would walk the streets talking of his work. This lovely idea that one of the points of the arts is to engage with people, to spread beyond those people who might naturally encounter the arts, and to reach out to broader communities is the very point, the very essence of the arts. And, and in a way, I think that's what we celebrate today. We recognize the way in which the arts can reach out beyond its core constituencies to reach people of all backgrounds, of all interests, and to bring all of us together. And here at the 92nd Street Y, uh, we're incredibly proud of, of the work that we do uh, in the public schools, in the work that we do. Uh, we're surrounded by an exhibition today, uh, and I'll encourage those who are in the room to, to look at these faces throughout um, the remarks today. This is an exhibition about Jerusalem, which just simply shows 12 faces of Jerusalem. You can't tell uh, who these people are. Some are very famous, some are not at all famous. Um, some are Jews, some are Christians, some are Muslims. And it reminds us all of the, humana the humanity of the arts, that that way in which it connects us all together. So we're incredibly proud of the work that the Y does to reach out uh, with the arts and connect with people whom we may not naturally encounter in our lives, just as Robert Frost did all those years ago, and to make points about the renewing power of the arts, just as Andra Schiff did, and just, indeed, as Erin and Carl did today. And I'll close by saying how proud I am, I am and how proud all of us are to be with uh, Robert Lynch today and the Americans for the Arts. Um, I'm a very unconvincing American. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I do realize that. Uh, my, my mother is a Texan, and my, uh, my uh, various efforts to order burritos have always gone badly. But, but uh, my, my great-great-great-grandfather is Francis Scott Key, so I have some vague credibility on these topics. And I would simply say this, that of all the things that America celebrates and all the things that America stands for and all the things that those around the world looking at America to celebrate look for. The arts is at the heart of that. We join uh, as allies with American for the Arts today and all the incredible work that you do. Uh, you do so much uh, for this country, for everything around the world, and most importantly for the arts that we treasure. We thank you. It's now my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, one of the pride and joys of the 92nd Street Y, Rebecca Dalla, who is going to talk about her own experience here at the Y. Uh, thank you all. Good afternoon. 
My name is Rebecca Dalla, and I'm a first-year student at Baruch College pursuing a degree in business and music studies. This past year, I participated in the 92nd Street Wise Teen Producers Program. Teen Producers was an amazing experience that opened my eyes to different careers in the arts, allowed me to start networking, and enabled me to create a production of my own. I showcased original music and poetry by students at Celia Cruz Bronx High School of Music and featured acclaimed violinist Jennifer Choi in a show at Lehman College. The experience enabled me to gain knowledge about careers in performance, sound and lighting design, marketing, artist management, and backstage production. When I first entered the program, I wanted to learn about the business side of the arts, and I learned that. Though I am unsure of my career, a career in the business side of the world of the arts is what I want to do for the rest of my life. Music has always been an integral part of my life. Before I was born, my mother used to sing to me in her womb. I have been singing from the age of two. In middle school, I started playing cello, piano, and guitar. In high school, I furthered my cello studies and began songwriting. I have always had a passion for music and always knew that I wanted to pursue a career in that path. My dream is to speak to people through my music. There is never a day that goes by where I am not singing, when I'm taking a shower, getting dressed, in the car, walking through the school hallway, I am singing. It is a part of who I am. Throughout my time in high school, music was the reason many kids came to school. Not too many of my peers were driven by math or English. They were inspired by the beauty of music to dedicate themselves to practicing every day. Through music, we were taught to value hard work and teamwork, and those skills helped us to strive academically. Art is a driving force, an inspiration. Art's education was the motivation that I and many of my peers needed in order to get through high school. I'd like to thank the 92nd Street Y for inviting me to speak today, and I'd like to introduce Michelle Dorrance, founder and artistic director of Dorrance Dance. I am not Michelle, uh, <laughs> but I want to just say uh, quickly, I am Bob Lynch, uh, President and CEO of Americans for the Arts, and um, it is an honor to be here in this uh, temple of the arts and learning uh, and of, of health uh, nationwide and here in this city. Um, I uh, also want to thank Carl and Aaron for their performance, uh, absolutely terrific. The, um, uh, Henry uh, and I get to do a lot of work together, um, and uh, I want to compliment him and return all of the nice words that, uh, that he had to say. Um, but my job is to say a little bit more about Michelle um, when uh, she uh, gets a chance to talk to you. So uh, at the Americans for the Arts Conference in June of 2016 in Boston, Mass., I had the pleasure of meeting our keynote speaker for today's event. She, <clears throat> she inspired us with her passion. She charmed us with her presence. Um, she impressed us with her incredible ability to create uh, inspire, an, an inspiring tapestries of sound. Uh, and she also believes that tap dance can change the world. How many other people believe that here? I do. Well. Michelle is the founder and artistic director of Dorrance Dance. Uh, she is one of the most sought after tap dancers of her generation. The New Yorker called her one of the most imaginative tap choreographers working today. She's a 2015 MacArthur Fellow, a 2014 Al uh, Alpert Award winner, and a 2013 Jacobs Pillow Dance Award winner. And she performs, teaches, and choreographs throughout the world. She also knows firsthand of the transformative impact of the arts in the lives of young people. And so please help me welcome this wonderful artist and keynote speaker to the stage, Michelle Dorrance. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, New York City. Um, it's really an honor to be here. Um, I'm going to reference this because I am on the clock, and when I go off the cuff, time restraints are destroyed. So I apologize for reading as much as I will be, but I'm, it's really an honor to share this afternoon with all of you. Um, I, first of all, I'm incredibly blessed to have two parents who are both exceptional educators. My father is one of the winningest coaches in sports history, 
coaching the United States women's national soccer team to win the first ever Women's World Cup, 1991, and coaching the University of North Carolina women's soccer team to 22 national championships so far. Go Heels. Um, my mom was a professional ballet dancer in Washington, D.C.'s National Ballet and in Elliott Feld's first company here in New York City, American Ballet Company. And the year after I was born, while she was a professor of dance at Duke University, she started the Ballet School of Chapel Hill in North Carolina, where I grew up studying ballet, jazz, and tap dance and met my tap dance mentor, one of the most generous and charismatic educators I know, Jean Medler. One of the many powerful lessons that Gene taught us by example was to always remain a student. He didn't start tap dancing until he was 27, and he constantly sought out the living masters of our form in order to pass on this tremendous legacy and heritage to us, eventually bringing us to learn from them right alongside him. Maybe it was just Gene, or maybe there is something inherent in the arts that inspires humility and a generosity of spirit. But Gene always wanted us to strive to be better than him. I will never forget taking class with Savion Glover for the first time when I was 13 years old at the St. Louis Tap Festival, and Jean strongly nudging us up to the very front of the class while standing in the back row. I could go on and on about Jean and his philosophies in tap dance that often felt like philosophies for life. The form follows the function, or dance to express, not to impress. But what I'm most compelled to share with you is his passion for and commitment to sharing tap dance, a perpetually underrecognized, misunderstood art form with children and teens of all ages in schools throughout North Carolina, all the while teaching us to be young arts educators in the process. I am beyond proud to be one of the oldest generations of alumni of the North Carolina Youth Tap Ensemble who, from age eight to 17, spoke and danced in le lecture demonstrations passing down the history of tap dance as an American art form and sharing the incredible possibility for expression in its unique embodiment of music and movement at the same time. My experiences as a part of these lectums that continue under Jean's direction to this day, still presented entirely by the young dancers of the ensemble, were at once eye-opening, touching, inspiring, humbling, empowering, and terrifying, and are at the core of why I know that arts, educa arts and education can bring about revolutionary change. I imagine that everyone in this room has experienced how artistic exploration and artistic expression foster a sense of self and help to develop personal identity. How the possibility of a sense of self and a unique self at that changes lives. How it gives young people of little means a world with endless means and endless possibilities. Naturally, I'm drawn to believe that the rhythmic arts hold something extra special in their core that foster connection, organic expression, and therefore transformation. Rhythm is at the core of our existence. It keeps us alive and permeates our purpose. It lives in our breath, in the cadence of our speech, in our footfalls as we walk down the street, and of course, in the beating of our hearts. Rhythm is a tool for universal communication and understanding. My mother shared a story with me recently from her time working with kids in a Head Start program that illustrates this simply and powerfully. She and the other dancers were leading a game of introduction that many of you may know with a group of three to five year olds in which in order to introduce oneself, the student must clap the rhythm of their name while they say it, Michelle, um, which the class then repeats together, Michelle. And there was one little boy who clapped and shared his name with the class and immediately the Head Start teachers looked to each other intensely, explaining to my mom later that the boy had never before spoken his name. There was something in him that connected innately to the rhythm of the expression. It is because I am a rhythm dancer, a tap dancer, that I have love for and faith in the power of arts edu education. Tap dance is one of the sharpest tools in our arts arsenal to inspire transformation, and simultaneously, it is an art form with the history of transcending oppressive circumstance to bring about powerful expression and positive change. There is something beautiful in the fabric of what could be described as our ideal America, the one that champions the constructive and not destructive ways our imagined American democracy is manifest. One of the defining American dreams, freedom, 
particularly freedom of speech, freedom of individual expression, is often manifest most powerfully when it had to be manifest most creatively. I look passionately, sorry, I look to tap dance not just as the form through which I express myself most honestly and most passionately, but as the art form that most thoroughly tells the history of our country through its own history. Many of you may know this history, but I want to share it with you briefly today. Tap dance is born of the plantation, where the drum was a symbol of freedom in many ways for the African-American slave. Drums kept African heritage alive in a culture of total oppression and also served as a means of subversive communication. When slave masters discovered that successful slave uprisings throughout the South were organized in large part through rhythmic communication, the drum was taken away, but tap dance was born. A form of expression that at its very core was a creative form of revolt. To learn to tap dance is to embody the African diaspora in a society that at its very foundation sought to oppress it. To learn the history of tap dance is to learn the history of racial inequality in this country, but also to learn how that inequality was transcended. To learn about the master tap technicians and innovators is to also learn about artists who are advocates for social change. Bill Robinson and Shirley Temple were the first black and white hands ever held on the silver screen. To learn the legacy of tap dance is to simultaneously learn of your responsibility to pass down that legacy, an oral tradition, and a black form. To be a professional tap dancer is to be an educator. Tap dance is the original American art form. And if I leave you with anything today, it is that in the name of arts edu and education in America, I am so proud to be, a proud of it, to be a part of an art form that carries the spirit of revolution and champions transformation, transcendence, resilience, and individual expression in a way that our current political climate does not. The art form is not fully realized without the passing down of its stories, its history, and its tradition to the next generation. We don't move forward without reaching back. Every capable artist must embrace the possibility of transformation through their roles as educators, and every educator must embrace the possibility of transformation through the arts. Thank you. Um, I now have the honor. Thanks, guys. Um, I have the honor of introducing our panel. Um, first of all, just thank you all for being here and for doing what you do. Um, what is really unique about introducing this panel is that it reflects the audience in this room, artists, educators, policymakers, and arts administrators. Let's continue the conversation. I am not the entire panel. Um, <laughs> so I would, I would like to invite the, the panelists uh, to come on up and join me here. And uh, let me, as they come up, uh, I'm always afraid when I see a setup like this and very pleased that there's no riser that we're sitting on because one of my very first lessons in advocacy, it was a one foot riser and um, I had six senators uh, up here uh, just like this and uh, we, they decided to adjust their chairs and the senator from Wyoming went over the back. Uh, and, but he never forgot me. And so that was a really important rule in advocacy. I want to um, I want to thank Michelle. I want to thank uh, Rebecca before her, um, and uh, I also want to just say a, a couple of words. I have th three board members here in the room from Americans for the Arts. They are the hardworking board members: Alessandra DiGiusto, John Hayworth, and Floyd Green at the end. So I thank them for being here very much, and I also want to mention uh, several staff. Uh, um, people, uh, Emma Osore, um, Narek Rome, Graham Dunstan, and Jeff Poland. Jeff, who has organized much of the arts advocacy work for this Arts Education Week, where's Jeff, raise your hand, is on a nine-day, nine-city tour, uh, doing this same event in nine different cities in Alabama, Tennessee, Florida, Georgia, Utah, Oregon, Pennsylvania, DC, and here in New York City. Thank you, Jeff, for arts education all across America. <laughs> So um, we have an embarrassment of riches tonight. Um, we have wonderful panelists. We have very little time. 
Um, so I'm going to say a word about each panelist, and then I'm going to ask them an opening question for each of them to answer in just a couple minutes. And then if we have time, I have a question for each one of them uh, following that. So uh, Kevin Koval is a poet, community builder, artistic director of, Sh of Young Chicago um, Authors, founder of Louder Than a Bomb, uh, the Chicago Youth Poetry Festival, and a professor uh, at the University of Illinois, Chicago. Uh, ten books, he's the author of ten of them, um, Breakbeat Poets, New, New American Poetry in the Age of Hip Hop and Shtick, love that, published in Poetry Magazine, love that magazine, and uh, Huffington Post, four seasons of HBO's Deaf Par uh, Poetry Jam, and his most recent collection, A People's History of Chicago, dropped uh, in April of, of 2017 on Haymarket Books. Thank you, Kevin, for being here, that's great. Um, Jacori 1200 Arthur educator, composer, and performing artist. He works to grow and inspire the young minds in Louisville communities and schools. Um, his rhymes address themes of expression, oppression, and progression. Uh, as an artist, 1200 fuses his Louisville, Kentucky hip hop roots with his conservatory training as a percussionist and composer to create new hybrid musical forms. And as an experienced public school music teacher, 1200 has a winning way with grade school students. Thank you for being here. Coco Killingsworth joined the Brooklyn Academy of Music's executive team in December 2016 as the organization's vice president of education and community engagement, overseeing BAM's broad initiatives for children, families, and students. Uh, she previously served as deputy director, director of programs for Global Kids Incorporated, where she managed school-based and after-school global education programs and special projects in 35 New York City public schools. She served on the board of directors for the Sadie Nash Leadership Project for Young Women, um, was a Charles Revson Fellow at Columbia University. She was also a principal dancer in ASE Dance Theater Collective, a uh, Brooklyn-based dance company, and she holds a BA in uh, History, African Studies from UCLA, and a Master's from Harvard. Thank you for being here with us. Paul King, next to me, is Executive Director of the Office of the Arts and Special Projects at the New York City Department of Education. He previously served as the Department of Education's Director of Theater Programs. And prior to joining the Department of Education, he held the position of Director of Education and Community Service for the New York City Opera. Um, he has served as a stage director for the New York City Opera, the Houston Grand Opera, and the Los Angeles Opera. Many, many awards, including the 2016 Very Special Arts, New York City Arts Advocate Award, New York Music Educators 2016 Honoree Award, um, recognition from the Emmy Foundation, uh, and many, many more things. And so I thank him very much for being here with us. And finally, my good friend, my board member, um, the inspiring Floyd Green III is vice president and head of community relations and urban marketing for Aetna, uh, Aetna Incorporated. He's responsible for developing grassroots marketing strategies to assist in business development, customer retention, health care disparities, and strategic partnerships. Uh, in January of 2013, Floyd was appointed to the National Board of Americans for the Arts. In 2012, he was appointed commissioner by Mayor uh, Sagara, Mayor of Hartford, to the Capital Region Development Authority. In addition, he serves on the boards of Hartford's Performs, the Center for Disease Control, the National Partnership Board for HIV AIDS, um, a number of other things, including um, his recognitions as 2016 Alumni Corporate Executive of the Year from Lincoln University, 2016 Connecticut Governor's Patron of the Arts Award, and one of Savoy's Magazine's 2012 and 2014 selections as the 100 Most Influential Black Executives in Corporate America. Floor, thank you. And I'm sorry, our time is up. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we have, um, uh, as I said, an embarrassment of riches, so I'm going to ask questions, and the panelists, unfortunately, each one could give a speech, but they need to just give a couple of minute answers to these questions. Um, so the first one is for everybody. We all have an arts education story about how we have seen the arts transform lives, which is what we're celebrating this week during National Arts in Education Week. Can you share with us your brief story in arts education 
and how from your vantage point as an educator, artist, business leader, or elected official, um, you've seen this transformation. And um, might we start with you? Oh, goodness. No, we don't have to. See, that's the danger in sitting next to you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was actually thinking of two stories, and I guess I'll tell you the one that is personal, which is um, my daughter was a very serious dancer. Um, and was what we lovingly called a bun-headed School of American Ballet for seven years, and very, very serious about it, and went to LaGuardia High School um, as, a, um, uh, as a dance major, um, and then went to college and had a rebellion, which is great, and decided not to do that. Um, but it was interesting. I went up to her college graduation, and she said something to me that I thought was so interesting, and she said, I don't think I could have graduated had I not been a dancer. She said, I don't think I would have had the discipline or the self-confidence to see it through. And I thought, you know, that's really extraordinary. So she may never decide, she's now back dancing again, of course. But, you know, I think, when I think about that and I think how empowering and how important it is for our kids to have that experience, and that's really what can sustain you through really difficult and challenging times. That's wonderful, thank you. Right yeah, down the line. cool. Um, good. Yeah, I, I, uh, I'm of the generation where I am. I'm a hip hop kid, and so I was raised by the arts, but not formally. Um, you know, the arts I was getting, of course, in my school was uh, very played and old, and you know, Eurocentric and corny. To be honest, you know, I thought like the only people who did poetry was old dead white dudes. Shout out to Robert Frost, but no offense. You know what I mean? And so. Um, but, but, but hip hop raised me. I wanted to become a, a teacher and a poet because KRS-One called himself a teacher and a poet. And uh, of course, hip hop is the largest global youth culture in the history of ever. Uh, and the impact I've had uh, and, and seen it have in the city of Chicago is we organize via hip hop uh, organize, community organizing principles. Our notion of bringing the arts all city is something that we take from uh, graffiti artists in this city. Uh, and the, na the, the notion of getting your, your name everywhere and so a lot of the Nabam, the Chicago Youth Poetry Festival is now 17, going on 18 years old. And the impact we've seen in Chicago is that now young people are taking the tool of spoken word, the tool of hip hop poetry, and using it to traverse the city in a new way. Chicago is one of the most hyper-segregated cities in America. And now we have a new radically inclusive, diverse culture of young people who are responsible for this moment, I would say, in Chicago cultural renaissance. And so the impact is profound. Um, I am a dancer since I was four years old, um, and I also am the child of two educators, um, an activist, and so I never really saw a distinction between learning and dancing or facilitating and choreographing. Um, and so my journey as an educator, I was always really incorporating both, and so even when I was talking to young people about foreign policy, I was thinking about how their minds moved around the subject matter and how um, to inspire their, how to inspire and bring their stories into what we were talking about. And that was always choreography and art to me. Um, I've only been at BAM for six months, um, but what I've brought and what I've seen is art giving a sense of home um, to young people, and our, and BAM is in the Fort Greene community, which is, um, you know, rapidly gentrifying, and the building is thought of as a fortress, um, but it uh, is not, the, to the community in, in Fort Greene, it wasn't a welcoming place, where, where there was a lot of avant-garde and contemporary art going on. It wasn't happening for that community um, in, in Fort Greene, Brooklyn. And so part of what BAM education has really been able to do is give young people in that community, in the Brooklyn community, who are culture makers, who are art makers, a sense of belonging in that building, a sense of purpose. And for them to understand when we talk about excellence in arts, it's about them doing their very best. It's about them at their very best, whatever that is. I just saw one of our interns in the audience. Um, and and um, speaking of that, I also had uh, one of our, our college interns who was a, par a participant in one of our programs um, when he was in high school. And he used to talk about always walking past BAM and never feeling anything, never feeling a connection, never feeling um, that he had a sense, a, a purpose to be there. 
Um, and after he just finished his, his internship with us, and I was, I was um, lucky enough to work with him for a short period of time, he talked about how he understood himself, how he understood a, a vast and diverse, um, or had a new and diverse verse, uh, sense of art that he would never been exposed to, um, and that he understood himself as excellent. And he, he'll tell you. He's excellent. Um, so, and that was what art did, and, and I was, uh, it's a profound experience to be a part of. Wonderful, thank you. So on paper, my name is Jacory. On stage, I go by 1200. In the classroom, I'm Mr. Arthur, and in a couple weeks, I'll be Professor Arthur. And those okay. different names kind of play into my roles back home in my community. First and foremost, I'm an educator. One day, I might be working with college students on some very difficult percussion repertoire, and the next day I might be singing Mary Had a Little Lamb with Kindergartners. <laughs> so it just kind of depends. As a composer and a performer, especially in Louisville, we have a very eclectic music scene, and I like to play into that idea of being an experimentalist, being someone who collaborates. So working with local hip hop artists all the way to working with symphony orchestras, I've worked with the Indianapolis Symphony, Pittsburgh Symphony, this week the Columbus Symphony, and really just trying to work both ends of the spectrums and showing people that there is no box you can put someone in as an artist. There is no label that you can put on them that really defines who they are and the way that they create. I didn't always want to be a musician or a teacher or an educator. I originally went through a lot of phases as a youngster. I wanted to be an astronaut. That didn't quite work out. <laughs> I wanted to play football. They nicknamed me Cookie. And I wanted to be a, a race car driver until I found out that was illegal. I wanted to like Fast and the Furious, not like NASCAR. <laughs> and then I, I saw the movie Drumline in like the fifth grade, and that totally morphed me in the way that I viewed the arts and the way that I viewed music. And I saved up all of my money from Christmas and my birthday, bought a recording studio, the Korg D1200, which is where my nickname came from, and taught myself how to produce music, how to record music, write it, song forms. And from there, taught myself as much as I could until I had to get formal training and went to college for that. And that's how arts education transformed me. So my mother uh, used to tell us as we were growing up that there was an art to doing your bed, your bed. There's an art to doing dishes. Three, three boys, three boys. And my favorite was there's an art to taking out the trash. <laughs> but I think what she was trying to say is that there's an art in everything we do, that the art is not separated from life. Art is who we are. Um, and so I was fortunate as a, as a child to have a public school system education in New Prince, Virginia, where art was just a part of who, of a part of our curriculum, whether it was coloring in the first grade or learning to dance to the Blue Danube in the fifth grade or doing 4-H projects um, with a popsicle st stem lamp, and who knew that I was infusing STEM and arts there and creating STEAM in the seventh grade of 4-H, seventh grade 4-H. You know, when, when you, you go through that, you just take it for granted. You just assume that every child, everyone has that ability to, to sort of dream because we know that um, the arts allow us to dream. Um, the arts get us to believe that dreams can come true, that the impossible is, that the poss impossible is possible. Um, and so when we take that away from people, we are sending very strong messages to our youth and to, to the future of our society. And so it's very important for me to make sure that I advocate that the arts is not a privilege, the arts are right. It's a right for every child, arts education is a right to every child, every individual um, that exists on this planet. And so we must do what we can and I will do what I can to continue to fight for that right. Great. Well, we have a stunning panel with lots of journeys and lots of, uh, lots of learnings from those journeys. So I, I get to ask one question, and they get to give one brief answer. Um, I get to ask one to each one of them. So Kevin, uh, as an educator, you use aesthetics and hip hop as tools in your work with students. What do you think it is about the arts, uh, your own experience, uh, that has made the difference in your own teaching? Well, I think we, we assume that a young person walking into a community center or a classroom is an expert. 
you know. And so we, we understand that they also come from a culture of experts and a culture of artists, and so we don't assume otherwise. I think that, uh, you know, I work with a lot of young people who might be tested at a particular level of uh, literacy that doesn't meet where they're actually literate, you know, because not only do they have various cultural literacies that many, may, many people in here might not have, but they might also enter a classroom space with 90 volumes of uh, albums on memory, you know, and, and they have that memorized, and yet, you know, they are, they're testing at a third, fourth, fifth grade reading level. And so part of what uh, my project has been to do as the educator is to also take young people for where they're at and then try to get them excited about what, what they've inherited to go back and also begin to record the world and world, the, the worlds around them. Uh, I was struck that when we were in the green room, there's a picture of Miss Gwendolyn Brooks uh, here, you know, who spoke here. And of course, she is the matriarch of Chicago. And in some ways, you could probably make the case, or at least I do, for that she's probably the matriarch of hip hop poetic practice. Uh, and she talked about recording the world right in front of her nose. And she said that her material was found in the street and so, you know, if you, if you take any one of us and you begin to articulate what is in front of you, that begins to connect to the totality of history. You know, if a Starbucks pops up on your corner, well, that has everything to do with this process of gentrification and global economy. If you have an empty lot near you, if you have a grandma who makes a dish that's a mashup of, you know, Polish and Korean food, well, that says something about where you come from and who you are. And so we take young people uh, where they're at consider them experts and geniuses and ask them to begin to record the experiences that they already are participating in. Great. I mean, it sounds like that, you know, just the, the messiness of the experience is the connector as well. It's what brings all of the, the, the arts into the lives that are messy today in, in life out there. Lots of different moving parts all the time, and it makes you a better teacher to be able to bring all those pieces. Well, yeah, I mean, I also have an easy gig. You know, I get to just go up into a spot and be like, yo, where are you from? Let me know, you know, because that, that's what hip hop does. And, and I think the messiness is that, you know, we want to put a lot of division between our lives, but the reality is that our lives, you know, live in that, in that mix and that we can't divorce our art ourselves from what's going on in the world. We can't divorce ourselves, our art, from what's happening in politics and, and where, we're com where, where we come from elucidates some of that. And especially in a city like Chicago, you know, we have young people who are coming from radically different kinds of places and our job as, a, as community organizers is to bring them together so they can see that there is this grand unfair disparity between the kinds of education, the kinds of access to arts and equity that, that young people in our city are getting. And so in that process, hopefully our work then is to begin to then use our critical creative imagination to begin to think about a different civic space that we might live into as well. You know? Great, great. Um, yes. <laughs> I have a question for a combination of uh, 1200 and Mr. Arthur. It's both the teacher and the artist. And the question is, as an artist and an activist, how have you seen the arts give voice to uh, students who otherwise aren't heard in their community? Michelle had a story about that, but how have you, how have you seen that? The best way to give someone a voice is to give someone a voice. So literally and figuratively, when you put a student on a stage, I've seen hundreds of students transform, turn into different people. The arts have what I like to call the four C's, so confidence, creativity, critical thinking, and collaboration. That confidence is a factor that a lot of people don't think about. It, it really takes a student from practicing that art form, believing in it, believing in themselves, having self-efficacy to get on stage and perform, just like Aaron and Carl earlier. They didn't always have that, or maybe they were born with it, but it takes quite the skill set. Critical thinking, the arts is stimulating your mind. It spans to every single other subject. Every single other subject lives within the arts, whether you're tap dancing, beatboxing, or burping the alphabet. You know, arts will play something to the way you think. And then when it comes to creativity, like I said earlier, there's no limit, there's no box. If I'm doing a math problem, you can tell me that math problem is wrong. You can tell me that I, I had a wrong uh, historical fact. But when I'm on stage and I'm rapping, or when Kevin's doing his poetry, when I'm playing marimba or with an orchestra, you can't tell me that I just performed wrong. It's art, it's the way that I express. And I think that when we do that and we create function and we have art that, that matters and does something to have a positive impact within the world, when we really put some importance on it and we have responsibilities as artists, as educators, that's what makes art education important. Wonderful, thank you. Um, for Coco. 
Um, I, uh, BAM is a community-based organization with an international reach. And it is a place, I'm a resident of DC, but I've had life-changing moments at BAM. Um, uh, one night with Pina Bausch alone was life-changing. Um, but uh, how have you integrated arts education programming across the work of the organization and has it made a difference? Um, I actually think um, BAM is a transformative space for, for people like yourself and people who have had the opportunity to come and be there. Um, but we still have a lot of work to do in terms of really integrating the principles I think that I hold deeply valuable of education, which is really democratizing space and finding and, and, and creating a space that's very inclusive. Um, and so I think the institution is looking towards that and, and by you know, joining departments like education and community together, the idea is that we're going to um, apply the principles of education to everything that we do. So it's not just about educating young people in K-12 spaces and giving them an opportunity to, to present their, their work and their voice, but it's also about educating audiences and, and again, um, bringing in new perspectives and new voices into the audience um, and into the buildings. Um, and giving them an opportunity to have those transformative experiences. So, you know, we're in this Next Wave Festival that's starting now, we're presenting, again, Pina Bausch, you know, our 35 years later and doing this avant-garde, you know, amazing work. And we're also in the same festival presenting um, educator artists like Mark Bamuti Joseph, and they're, you know, looking at how freedom and art and soccer relate. So I think, you know, we're looking at, we're doing that work. Um, there's still quite a bit more to do, um, but I think it's about taking the spirit of education and applying it to the art and the audience development. Thank you. Um, so for Paul, so we've talked about artists, we've talked about schools, we've talked about um, uh, arts organizations, and um, I'd like to talk a little bit about um, the institution of the school itself in New York City. So recently, New York City has undergone a transformation with arts education, and it does periodically go through that transformation. Um, what trends have you seen now, lately, in, uh, in general, but in access, equity, and quality of, of programming? Uh, and are we reaching all of the students that we re need to reach? I know that answer is no, but just in general, how are we uh, doing? Uh, I think we're doing better. But uh, we have miles to go. Um, I think you know there are significant issues in the city um, about equity and access, um, and sometimes it's even geographic, you know, because we think of kids who are isolated in Far Rockaway or Staten Island who don't have the same kind of access. Um, and uh, I also worry a lot about um, communities of our students who are um, immigrants or English language learners or those who have special needs and how well we're serving them in and through the arts. Um, so I think there's significant work to do. Um, I think you know we have made significant work in terms of being more equitable, but I think the counterpoint to equity and access is it has to be excellent. And we really have to honor our kids with really excellent engagement, excellent artists interacting with them. And the kind of, um, I mean, to hear you guys talking, which is exactly right, um, acknowledging their own voices and, and that kind of empowerment. Um, and then lastly, I think what's really important in arts education is that it can't just be about appreciation. I want all of our kids to make art. Right? So it's not this academic exercise of just reading a book and appreciating. All of our kids are genuinely and authentically artists, and that's what we need to do a better job of, of making sure they all have those opportunities. Great. Uh, you know, it reminds me about the making part. Um, at our annual conference, uh, we had a, a session called For the Love of It. Floyd was part of that session. Um, and it, it, it's about art that comes out of garage bands like my art form did, or yeah. um, just the untrained piece of this that's the inspiring part for the in-school piece of this, I think. Uh, they go hand in hand. So Floyd, um, uh, from a business perspective, 
or any perspective you'd like. Um, how is arts education beneficial to, to you as a business person uh, or your company? And how can the arts integrate with other subjects like STEM to, to really move the needle for creativity and innovation in the workplace? So I think I'll answer my own question. I, no. <laughs> Um, you know, if we look at, if we look at a, a phone, right, you, we see the intersection between art and technology, right? So you look at that digital canvas and there is uh, amazing technology that exists there, but then what attracts us are the vivid colors and uh, sort of the designs of those apps. Well, that's art that does that. Um, and, and so from a business standpoint, what is so important for us, you know, I think in three areas, one, the next generation of products and services that we have to design in order to be competitive in this global community has to incorporate the arts, has to incorporate sort of a new way of thinking. And the arts allow us to do that. Allow, the arts allow us to break the boundaries, right? To, to, to believe that you know, um, we, can, we can create things that haven't been seen or, or done before. Internally, uh, which is important, is that we have to have a strong workforce in order to make sure that those products and services are delivered in a relevant way to the communities and, and consumers who we're trying to market to. So we use the arts in order to sort of create a vibrant um, um, employee base. So we, Aetna has a chief mindfulness officer, we're one of the first corporations to have a chief mindfulness officer, Andy Lee. And so we practice mindful, uh, mindfulness and yoga and meditation. We practice being present and being in the moment. Um, and this is throughout our sort of our, our organization. That's, that's very important because sometimes when you're in a very competitive workforce, it's important for us to just stop and breathe for a moment, to just be present, um, to just really hear our thoughts. Um, the other thing is that we bring in um, improvisationists, we bring in um, actors and others to help us learn to uh, work on improv and help us learn to sort of be in the moment. We have our own um, jazz band. We have our own art gallery within uh, sort of um, our, our offices. Um, we bring in musicians and educators, art educators, into our building um, to help us um, breathe, to help us just take a moment, because we know that there's healing through the arts. We know that there's a direct correlation between arts and well-being, and so a healthier workforce will allow us to even produce even greater. But more so, our communities are in desperate need of healing. And the arts is a powerful way, a powerful way of healing our communities. Um, infusing money into schools, um, teaching young kids yoga, um, helping them understand that maybe they're not hyperactive, may, or, or ADHD or ADD, but maybe they're are the next you know, jazz saxophonist, or are, are, are incredible you know, um, artists, or pianist who's ultimately going to be a physicist or mathematician. mathematician. Um, we know that our communities are hurting right now, and so the arts can, can bring, bring communities together, as we're seeing um, all throughout this country when, when there's disaster. So from a business standpoint, it just makes sense for us to be involved in the arts. It just makes business sense for us to make sure that our employees are involved in the arts. And it just makes sound community-based sense that we invest in our communities and the people who are inspiring our next generation to be competitive leaders in this global economy. Thank you. That's great. Um, and, and I'll just point out that Aetna is the, the leading arts business, in, or the leading business in America, using the arts for all of those um, employee advancement, business goals advancement uh, kinds of objectives that uh, Floyd was referencing. Um, so this panel has been incredibly good, so good, that uh, we have an on-time um, end of the first part here, which allows time for questions from um, all of you. Uh, and we have about 15 minutes for questions, but because we're being live streamed, um, a Twitter question beat you, so you have a moment. <laughs> you have a moment to think about this, and then you can ask the question. But the question from from um, Twitter is: um, As president of the United States, no, I'm sorry. Uh, so, um, so what is next for arts education in America? And you know, you've each addressed it in a way what you think is important. But um, is there more that anyone would like to add about what is next for arts education in America? Uh, you. 
I, I just think all of us in this room need to own it. Arts education is just as important as science education. It's just as important as any other education. And yet, when we look at funding, arts education is one of the first to go. We should be adamant. We should be livid over the fact that uh, the culture of our, or our soul is being told to us that it's not as important. Um, and so I think if there's something that I, I'd like to just share to those who are, who are out there um, watching or streaming and the people in this room is where, we, we need to ignite something within us to make sure that our art educators as well as our children and our communities get the arts and arts education that they need in order to remain vibrant. Yeah, I mean, I, I think cultural institutions and educational institutions also need to get hip or die trying. And, and part of what I mean is that what happens on the stage has to be reflective of who is in the city. It also, the audience also has to be reflective of who is in the city. And we can no longer reify the same kind of socioeconomic segregated spaces that our culture and capitalism demands. You know, and so our, our, all of these spaces need to be for the people for real. And I think that there, is a, that there is a fear in arts education because it ultimately demands a kind of imagination that would create a society that looks different than the one uh, that we are currently living in, in this moment. And so I think we need to push because we desperately need a different society than the one that we're living in in this moment, so. You, you know, the Americans for the Arts slogan, uh, our vision slogan is all the arts, all the people. But get hip or die trying is a lot. It's y'all's, man. I'm look, to go with look, that. Man. I mean, I wanted to it's make live it. stream, so you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. you, you heard it here I first, did. but also shout out to 50. Yeah. Coco. Did, were you raising your microphone, Coco? No, no. Oh, okay. Yeah, go ahead then. Yeah. I was just going to say the arts, you know, makes us human. Somebody told me a while ago when I was learning how to play saxophone, I was embarrassed, but I was learning how to play saxophone. They said, oh, you can do it. A monkey can play saxophone. I'm like, no, they can't. I saw a video of, of someone, um, <laughs> sorry, someone controlling a robot that played a marimba, which is like a piano, if, if you don't know what that is. And part of me was like, that's dope. And the other part of me was like, that's disturbing. You know, <laughs> you, you can't take what we do, what we practice, spend 10,000 hours on and give it to a robot. And I know the world is advancing in terms of technology, but if we lose art, we use humanity. I'm not quite as radical as you are, surprisingly. But, um, but I think you know one of the things that I get very concerned about with educators um, is that education is so siloed, and it's easy to categorize. And I think we do that in the arts as well. And I, I, you know, I get really disturbed when I think about how we can't even get teachers across art forms to collaborate and kind of shake it up. And that's not the way the world exists anymore. So you know, I, I, that's what I'd like to see next in arts education, is how do we break down those barriers in and through the arts so that um, you know, really interesting, authentic, new pieces are coming about. Well, as the only woman up here on this panel, um, I feel like it's very important to talk about the fact that, again, this art needs to be the place of the great equalizer and really um, bringing different voices um, and as, as Kevin said, changing things because things need to change and um, really opening other, pers open, being open to other perspectives and ways of expressing. Um, it's, it, you know, the, the moment is now. There is not, there's not any time to wait. And I, I deeply believe that. I think in the schools we need to fight for computers and crayons. Computers and crayons. <laughs> Questions out there for the panel? Anyone? Yes, far right. Trying to understand why sort of the word art became sort of bad word. I mean, it became a very, along the way, it came to be like, you know, that's, you know, it's not part of serious education. When did that happen and why is it that we need to recover? I'll throw out my answer and then I'd love to hear other people's perspective. Puritans. Um, well, exactly. I mean, it, it's actually, it's, it's a, it's a 400, 500 year struggle on this continent. If you think about the Native American populations that were here before Columbus, the Native Americans, uh, Native American populations, um, most of them have no word for art. 
because it's not separate. It's not a, it's not a thing that's pulled out. It's part of cooking and ritual and community and housing and everything. Um, and if, if, if uh, you know, you think about who came to our continent, they were people fleeing religious persecution or, or they were people that had to start from scratch uh, fighting for um, a foothold. And um, literally, so a, a very practical uh, uh, people, but literally when the Puritans came um, in uh, the 1620s, 1625, they outlawed the arts. They outlawed theater, they outlawed dance. The reason was it was not considered um, for the greater glory of God. But that had an impact, and it happened in the 1700s as well. Um, new governors came in and outlawed the arts, outlawed, closed all the theaters that had started up. So, you know, I, I feel that we've had a long history of um, surges forward like the WPA and setbacks like um, these kinds of things or the attacks that the Heritage Foundation, for example, makes on the value of the arts. And that backdrop is fought out in city councils and school boards and so on. But that's my take. Uh, anyone else? I think also that schools were really designed to socialize and, you know, socialize individuals and keep them in very prescribed and prescriptive, prescriptive lanes. Um, and the arts is so subversive or is, is about thinking outside of those um, configurations and thinking um, and dreaming beyond that. And I, I think in its current iteration, because of all the history we just learned, um, they, it, it, it was very hard to, to really bring and integrate the arts. It, it, it became something that was um, almost antithetical to what was happening in schools and in, 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 in regular socializing institutions. Um, you have current history that really is about, um, you know, there, I went to a magnet art school um, in high school and that was about let's, let's really pull in the arts and integrate the arts. Even thinking about how in, integration is trying to bring it back from when, once it was segregated. So it's this long process of trying to um, undo what's been done. but. The institutions are almost at odds. Yes, in the back there. So I, let me just react, and I would like to ask you your opinion on this, because um, I agree totally, and some, some uh, inroads to overcome that were made, or allegedly made, with the, the new law that was passed last year, the Every Student Succeeds Act, that was supposed to help eliminate some of those testing barriers that excluded the arts. Can, can you want to make a comment on how that worked or is working? Well, I think we don't know yet how it's working. I mean, we know what New York State has proposed to the feds, which actually is really interesting in that arts education is part of the required instruction and must be reported back to the feds. So I think that's great. And we're beginning to see that in um, you know, a number of states where it's becoming part of the required um, instruction that they have to offer to kids. So it's not quite as... Um, uh, it, I, th you know, I think we are a society, unfortunately, that values what can be tested, right? What can be codified. Um, and so I think it's a longer path to get over that kind of obsession. But, um, but I think it's also important that we're really articulate about um, how the arts can be assessed. And by, I don't mean tested, right? But we know when they're successful for kids. And so we need to be able to articulate that. Or we need to have kids write back to us what they thought about that arts project so that we have a way to document their, the learning that took place. 
So I, you know, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's kind of a, a, a balancing act here to make sure that we don't undervalue the arts, that we really have some evidence to support it as well. I'm just gonna piggyback on what he said about, about arts and requirements and whatnot. Kentucky is also a state where we require arts to be a part of the core subjects, but there's only 27 out of our 50 states that have that requirement. And I think the next step would be have all 50 and also have some accountability. You know, we have that access, but is it something that's excellent? Are we holding them accountable? How are we testing the arts and how are we holding that up to the rest of the core subjects? So I see one hand over there and then I see you. You, you had your hand up in the back, yes. Yeah. Me? Yes, you. Yes. Well, I think that's part of the part of the surges forward and big setbacks that I was talking about. You know, what was there before wasn't necessarily that great in communities, and then all of a sudden a progressive person comes in and it's great, and then it, it's lost again. Go ahead. Well, no, I, I agree. I mean, we organize in the schools for that reason, and part of the work that we try to do is create crews or teams of poets inside of high schools and middle schools. Uh, it's kind of like basketball meets a rap battle, um, but it's like the, the poets now are walking around Chicago public schools like star athletes because they have an after school space uh, to build in the school day, but also primarily in the freedom of that after school space with one another. And there's that camaraderie and community that comes in the process of making art and that has proven to be essential in, in the city. So we've come to the end, except I did see one hand and I said I would ask you the question. So we have. Well, you know, I'm a big proponent of STEAM. Um, you know, I may not necessarily understand mathematics, but if I'm playing a mu an instrument, I'm learning fractions. And so I might be able to apply that back to mathematics and not be afraid of it. Who knows what they would have labeled me as a child. But fortunately, they put some clay in front of me and that kept me focused. And I think sometimes it's just important for us to be a little bit more patient with our children and just really allow the arts to do what they were designed to do. Um, and yes, there are some you know, folks that might need um, you know, additional help, but let's start with art, right? Let's, let's start with the, the, the gift of really letting a child become who they were born to be and then manage that. So I, I'm sure you know, Americans for the Arts have some um, programs that are designed specifically for the, that, that type of uh, approach, but you know, my, my, my thinking there was that as opposed to immediately going and labeling, let's just give a child an opportunity to dream and uh, allow that child to become its full potential through the arts. It's a much better idea than sending them to the counselor for an hour a week. <laughs> I, I, I think, uh, you know, sometimes it's a lot less, um, a lot less expensive than pills and medication. Sometimes, uh, you know, a songbook or, a, you know, again, a crayon or, or a pen to write a poem to tell you how I'm feeling or how that child is feeling might be just a little bit more successful than, you know, the, the clinical aspect. Last comment? I just wanted to also share, not just in terms of the programs that young people can participate in, in terms of making art, but also 
um, experiencing art. Um, I, BAM does, and I know other institutions um, do, does relaxed performances for young people who are on the autistic spectrum or have other, other abled, other, other abilities. Um, and so it's really um, taking elements of the performance and making it um, accessible for all audiences so that it's you know, not having loud sounds or, or changing light configurations, but really giving everybody an opportunity um, to enjoy a show and not feel, um, or experience art and not feel uh, that they're bothering anybody else or that they're, um, uh, that they're less than. And, and that other audience members may or may not know that they're a part of a relaxed performance. It's not um, that they're um, kept away from the, from we don't leave the public, uh, the other, other public out, but really just um, introducing this as a way of participating in art for everybody. So we've had a really great conversation in a little short period of time. We've gone from talk of uh, at, the, at the grassroots level, at the school level, at the outside of school, inside of school level, and at the national policy level, all of those pieces. <clears throat> I want to just end with a comment about the national policy level. That's the piece of the block that we work on. We have a program called the Arts Action Fund, and it's free. You sign up for it, and then you get to be a political activist. We send you information on arts education or all of the big causes that we're working on today, like funding for the National Endowment for the Arts um, or the, um, the idea of uh, uh, humanities, National Endowment for the Humanities, and arts education. And in the arts education arena, Narek Rome is over there. He leads our advocacy efforts on that front. He tells me that today the Senate Appropriations Committee appropriated $27 million for uh, demonstration arts education grants, and that the Title I money that we were fighting for, $15 billion, the appropriations um, uh, was passed. Uh, it has further to go with a $25 million increase for arts education. These are small steps. It happens because of citizen action. I thank you. And I thank our great panel. Thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Thank you to Americans for the Arts and all our amazing panelists, our performers, our speakers, our keynote. Um, my name is Larissa Gelman. I run the Education Outreach Center here at 92i. And if you were inspired about the conversation, the earnest and transparent conversation about arts education, please keep it going this week. This is National Arts and Education Week. Um, we have a couple of hashtags. Um, hashtag Arts Ed Week and hashtag Because of Arts Ed. We'd love to hear your voices, so please keep them going. And we invite all of you here at 92i to stay for a lovely reception. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful Arts Ed Week. <laughs>